Good afternoon. Um, my name is Barb Kasky. I am the director of Macomb County Community Corrections. It's a little better. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be um, in front of you today to discuss the programming that Community Corrections provides, particularly focusing on the pretrial programming that we discussed um, when the overview of the jail reform study took place. Um, <clears throat> so we'll be talking a little bit um, about some of our other programming, but really focusing on that. Um, I, you can see that we brought an, a general overview PowerPoint presentation. Um, community Corrections was developed in the mid-80s by the state of Michigan uh, under Public Act 511, um, really as a response to overcrowding in our state prison system and our local jails as a result of the crack cocaine epidemic, much like what we have going on now with our opiate use epidemic. Um, we have community corrections offices in most of the counties across the state. Some of them encompass several counties and more of the more rural areas. In Macomb, obviously, we are fortunate to just have our own office and, and focus on the large number of individuals that we, um, we are servicing in our county. Um, we have three different types of services or services that take place at three different stages in the criminal justice system. One, again, being pretrial services, um, we also provide alternative sentencing options to the district and circuit courts in Macomb County. Um, and also substance abuse assessment and treatment services as well as drug testing, um, electronic monitoring, things of that nature to probationers in circuit court in Macomb County. To talk specifically about pretrial services, and again, I know we talked a little bit about this um, through the jail reform study, but really the purpose of our pretrial program is to identify those individuals who are low risk and could be appropriately supervised in the community um, with limited or no conditions. Um, those individuals who are moderate or higher risk, we typically are identifying those specific needs and making recommendations for supervision tools specific to that defendant that may be drug testing, um, outpatient or inpatient substance abuse or mental health programming, as well as electronic monitoring. And those individuals who are high risk and who are determined to be better supervised um, in a correctional facility until they reach the disposition of their case. Uh, we all know, and again, I'm sure you're familiar with when the um, jail study was released, that our pre-sentence population in the jail really fluctuates at just about 50% to over that about 60%, um, which is a large amount of individuals who are sitting in the county jail who have not been um, yet convicted of the charge that they have against them or charges. Um, the goal of pretrial programming is to really try to use data that's been gathered <clears throat> across um, the country really for the last couple of decades that indicates there are certain specific sort of factors that we can look at with each individual that will tell us based on statistics what their risk is um, in terms of failing to appear for court um, or being non-compliant with um, in the community while they're awaiting disposition of their case. Uh, we know that the pretrial population impacts our jail space. It takes up a large number, usually more than half of the jail space that we have. <clears throat> it also reduces, um, I'm sorry, it's it, likelihood of future recidivism is impacted, um, and it allows defendants to remain stable in their employment, um, to continue residing with their families in the community, uh, their finances, um, you know, mental health and substance abuse treatment as well. Again, I mentioned those evidence-based risk factors, and these are typically used with every pretrial program across the country, because we know that the data behind that says that these really are the predictive factors of someone failing to appear for court or becoming non-compliant in the community. Um, their primary charge, their release pending trial at time of arrest, what that means is that were they arrested for another case, released, and then picked up another charge while they were in the community. Their criminal history, two or more failure to appears, makes a lot of sense if they failed to appear before, likely to do it again. Um, their history of violent convictions, the length of their current residence, and are they employed or a <clears throat> primary caregiver, and their history of drug abuse. Um, Again, this is research that was um, 
presented to the board, I know by myself a couple years ago, and I think some of it was also highlighted in the reform study, that we know that if you take someone who's low risk and you detain them um, for the entire pretrial period, they're more likely to be sentenced to a jail term, a prison term, um, and that their prison terms and jail terms are significantly longer than those who are released on a pretrial basis. And again, more research to indicate if you have someone that comes in and they're held for even two to three days, those low-risk defendants are almost 40% more likely to commit new crimes um, than equivalent defendants who were held for no more than 24 hours. Um, it's, it, it sort of makes a lot of sense when you think about the fact that within 24 hours, you're going to have to call an employer and tell them why you're not coming to work. You're going to have to call your wife and tell her why you're not coming to home. There are a lot of things that can be impacted in that period of time. And when they're held for 8 to 14 days, that risk increases to 51%. The components of pretrial programming, when we administer a risk and screening tool, based on the score and the outcome of that tool, determine whether we need to recommend any programming at all, whether we think that they would be suitable to be in the community and will, um, on their own, show up for court and um, not participate in new criminal activity, or it could indicate that um, drug and alcohol testing are required. Um, telephone reporting, which we know increases the likelihood in any in a number of different pretrial programs that they've studied, that having a, pre, a telephone reporting program can increase the rate of appearance at court by 25% just with the telephone call to remind them they have a hearing. Uh, we also have in-person reporting and electronic monitoring, and are also known as tether, um, various types of that, GPS tether. Um, the RF tethers, Soberlink and Scram, which are both alcohol monitoring tethers. Uh, outpatient substance abuse and mental health programming and residential substance abuse treatment for up to 90 days. Outside of our pretrial programming, we also have alternative sentencing, which is really focused in Macomb County on those individuals with identified substance abuse needs. Um, we have um, a good relationship with both the district and the circuit courts who refer a number of individuals to us on a regular basis that are identified as having a substance abuse need. And uh, you've probably heard the statistics before, it's 85 to 90 percent of anyone who's incarcerated has a substance abuse issue. And so we work with those, um, with those courts and our probation departments as well as our vendors that provide substance abuse treatment and the Department of Corrections who funds the majority of our office to identify <clears throat> programming that can be anywhere from 12 to 180 days in length depending on that person's need and where they're at in our um, criminal justice system. These, um, the data that we included in our presentation is also uh, numbers that I'm sure some of you have seen before. We know that it costs more to incarcerate someone. We know that <clears throat> that there is a 30% reduction in recidivism when you apply appropriate treatment to an individual rather than traditional punishments like incarceration. And our jail and overcrowding, um, jail overcrowding issues are not going to be resolved anytime soon. Um, regardless of how big you build it, we will fill it. Uh, and looking at smarter, um, more behavior conscious uh, criminal justice is sort of where a lot of counties and states are heading and we're trying to do the same in Macomb County. Just an overview of some of the residential services that are provided. <clears throat> the Michigan Department of Corrections um, will pay for up to 90 days of substance abuse treatment for any individual who is charged with or convicted of a felony and is currently on probation. We also have a, our, what we call our MRAP or Macomb um, residential alternative to prison, which is up to 180 days of residential treatment for someone who would otherwise be prison bound. That programming <clears throat> encompasses more than just substance abuse treatment. It's really focusing on employment readiness, um, peer recovery coaching that starts in the facility and then continues when they're in the community. And also, obviously, um, substance abuse with an opiate specific track um, more sort of overview of some of the residential programs that we have, and we also have relationships with providers in the community. Um, Macosa is a, <clears throat> a large supporter of our programming, and if we have an individual that comes to us and is not appropriate or not eligible for funding through our services for residential treatment, 
uh, we have a collaborative relationship where we can provide the assessment for someone, send it to them, and then they determine an authorized residential treatment through their funding. Also outpatient programming, we have been for a number of years providing dual diagnosis services for those individuals who have both substance abuse and mental health concerns that allows them to have access to a psychiatrist when they're released. There is no you know, two month wait to get um, to, in to see that psychiatrist or the medications that they need to stay stable in the community. Our opiate specific groups, again, we continue to try to focus resources on those opiate um, sort of specific clientele that our numbers are continue to climb. Our marijuana specific group and our cognitive behavioral programming in the community. In addition to that, as I mentioned before, we have other programs such as electronic monitoring. We do a lot of um, tether monitoring that the uh, judge can order an individual to be, rather than held in the jail, released to the community and be supervised in electronic monitoring for up to a year and um, we are able to provide some assistance for those individuals who are indigent and cannot afford those costs because it can be very expensive. A drug testing for both misdemeanors and um, we also have felony specific programs. And our MARCH program, which is a community service program that we have individuals that typically you would be ordered to a certain amount of hours, 100, 200 hours of community service and you could do something like go rake leaves somewhere. Um, we have implemented a number of years ago a very structured program where we set up relationships with nonprofits in the community that needed help um, and said, would you be willing to actually supervise these individuals in a seven hour workday, um, sign off every day that they work, send us the information, we will certainly take care of any behavioral issues because we will address that directly with the courts and the probation departments. And um, that program has been extremely successful and has even allowed um, opportunities for long-term employment for a couple of the participants. And our jail-based CRP program provides cognitive behavioral programming um, while individuals are incarcerated in the county jail. And again, our assessments and recommendations for probation. Just a run through of some of the um, FY16 services, obviously with um, us being in the middle of fiscal year 17 where we don't have those closeout numbers yet. But just an idea of how many individuals, we're looking at 700 individuals that we placed in substance abuse treatment over the course of that year. Um, to about 1,200 pretrial screenings um, and 614 monitored and pretrial services. We are hoping to do much more than that in the future. And just a couple of um, items that you know, we'll be talking about these both in our budget submission, but some of the barriers that we have to sort of continued growth and um, successful programming. The lack of linked data systems for all district and circuit courts. Again, identified in the reform study, there is no central data location for our district courts. They, um, if you wanna find out if someone has an upcoming court date or if they showed up for court today, you're literally picking up the phone and calling each and every one of the circuit courts, or I'm sorry, district courts that you have individuals at. Obviously, the relationship that we have with um, our circuit court, we're able to get information much more quickly um, through court view as well as um, you know email access to some of that information. The the minimal amount of individuals that were able to reach prior to arraignment for pretrial services is a result of those all of the local PDs that we have that hold individuals when they're arrested for you know maybe 24 hours and maybe up to a week, so that we're really only able to access those individuals who are arrested and brought directly to the Macomb County Sheriff's Department. Um, and the short time frame from booking to arraignment that requires the reports to be submitted means you have to have individuals who are working very hard in the early morning hours to assess those individuals, run their criminal histories, verify information, uh, and then get that to the court before, say, a 10 o'clock arraignment. So it's, it's a busy, busy office um, from about 7 to 10 o'clock in the morning. And again, continued rise in opiate use resulting um, in increased need for treatment. I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Uh, you are all aware of it, and we are doing our best to increase the services that we have available to, to address that issue. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them.
Commissioner Kleinfeld. Thank you, Chair. Um, I understand why um, when somebody's do, uh, pre trial, um, why they're more likely to commit crimes and things because they lose jobs and all sure. of those sorts of things. <laughs> Um, but why are they more likely to be sentenced to jail and why are they more likely to be sentenced to longer terms than others? Um, it's a very good question. I think that's probably a result of a number of things. If you have a defendant that comes in front of you um, in the court as the court and makes, you know, you know that this individual has been successful in the community for a number of months while they're awaiting sentencing and this individual, for whatever reason, needed to be incarcerated, I think that that sort of... Um, can can taint, um, you know, your perception of that that defendant one way or the other. Okay, and um, this might be a naive question, but um, are, are those that are that are sitting in jail? Do they come in in in, in a, a jail uniform? I I am the reason I'm confused on this is because sure. you know I see high profile cases. I know the person's in jail, but they come in in a nice outfit but i've also seen prisoners come into court in jail outfits brought in you know and so i don't know why that is and and why that occurs sometimes but not always um for the most part they come in in a jail uniform um there are specific circumstances where if they have someone who brings them and most often in a trial situation um, if they have someone, a family member, that's able to secure clothing for them and bring them that to them, that they're allowed to change out. But in most cases, they are wearing a jail uniform. So do you think there's a psychological opponent, uh, a proponent, uh, component to having somebody in front of you, maybe not in a trial, but maybe even a judge, having somebody in front of you wearing a prison uh, uniform as opposed to wearing a suit because they're out? I would think yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Kleinfeld actually touched on uh, the core of my question. I, I, too, was confused if, if there are two defendants that are uh, uh, otherwise equal, um, and one is held for 24 hours, one is held for 48 hours, mm -hmm. there's a 40% chance more that the person held for 40 hours will recommit a crime than the person held for 24, <laughs> even if all other factors are equal? Based on the data from the Arnold Foundation, that's, I believe I cited it on that actual side, that that is, it, they're more likely to, um, and let me go back to that so I make sure we're, <coughs> yeah, more likely to commit new crimes before trial. So within that period prior to the disposition of their case, they're 40% more likely to commit new crime. Huh, that's interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Barb, thank you for coming here no today. Um, I, first of all, I am not an expert in the jail and in, in, in treatment and criminal justice, so I apologize if I come across as uh, wanting to learn a lot of things here, but. Uh, my question to you is, first of all, and this is to the whole board, we had a presentation by Sheriff Wickersham last month about the new jail proposal, central booking, more brick and mortar, and things like that. And we have yet, we'll see how much that's going to cost, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to come back to this Board of Commissioners in the next year, I believe, and this board is going to have to make a decision on, on how, where to go about on that, you know. Early talk right now is is bond proposal uh, on a ballot. That's the early talk. There's a lot of different ways to finance something like that. Sure. That would be one. But the thing that really bo bothers me, and I've thought this for years, because I I've, I've have been in the jail a lot, and just knowing that you're saying 85 to 90% of the people in the jail, what's that? Personally? I've been right. at the jail a lot for tours. Is that Sorry. what's doing it? Okay, not that way. I don't want to. So, but the thing that's shocking, you said just now that 85 to 90 percent of all the people in the jail right now yes. have substance abuse problems. Yes, and you'll find that in most correctional facilities across the country, whether it's federal, state, local. I mean, when uh, that just seems unacceptable, and for those numbers to be so high. I feel like we as a society, the county, the courts, the jail, that we've failed, literally. I mean, I think that's just unacceptable. And um, let me just finish also. So the thing is, is 
you know, and, and this is me as a county commissioner, public official, and this is me as a private citizen mm -hmm. thinking this way. How can we go out and ask residents for a certain amount of dollars to build the central booking I'm for and all that, I understand mm -hmm. all that, okay? But to build, you know, more rooms and stuff, which is more expensive, it's a lot cheaper for treatment. You know, so that's one thing that I think about, which, which I'm gonna have to look at uh, on whether or not, how we're gonna finance this next year, bail proposal or tax increase or whatever. So that's where I'm coming from. I don't know where the rest of you commissioners think, but that's my thinking. I wanna hear response um, from you about that. No, and I'd like to comment on that because um, I think that what the, the core goals of the recommendations are that came from that study are really to not not add a whole ton of more beds. Um, what they're trying to do is take the system that we have and do it more effective so that one, the central intake can identify those individuals who are most appropriate for some other kind of programming. If we know when somebody walks in that they're mentally ill and that they have chronic substance abuse problems, we want the physical space and the staff there to be able to identify that immediately. And that really is ingrained in that proposal, which I was very happy to see. And there's also the idea that the space that we have for those individuals who might not be appropriate for release to, to the community, say for instance, mental health cells, that the way that they're set up now, um, you know, that the, the plan that is proposed takes that and really upgrades the way that we think about even holding prisoners okay, who me, have mental health issues. Let me stop issue. you right there sure. and ask you a question. So sure. uh, do they have other parts of the country that have a jail or central booking system similar to what we want to do, uh, do you know of that? And, and have they implemented something like that where it's reduced or helped out uh, or reduced uh, substance abuse um, people in the jail? Um, in terms of reduction yeah. of the number of substance abuse um, or substance abusers within the jail, I can't speak to that. I know that there are several programs that I'm aware of across the country that have developed this type of central intake system. I know one was in a direct response to mental health needs that they had in their community, and they did see a reduction of individuals who came in with mental health needs that were being supervised, and, and those issues were being managed in the community. But I'd be happy to look into the sort of specific substance abuse. Okay, do you understand where I'm coming yes, from, I what I'm telling do. you about? It just seems that if we put more energy, money, people into substance abuse and mental health, mm -hmm. we're gonna have less people in the jail. If we have less people in the jail, it's gonna cost society, the taxpayers, less money, which is what we're always looking to do, right, Leon? always looking to do that <laughs> um, and I so. do I, I completely understand with what you're saying and I think that that's that's a, an appropriate response the problem that we have is that individuals who are involved in the criminal justice system um, whether treatment services are available in the community sort of find themselves incarcerated before they even get to treatment so it ends up being um, that we're still providing them with treatment because that's the first place that we are exposed to them at if that makes sense yeah they don't walk into a treatment center they um, involuntarily come to us. Okay, thanks for coming here, and, and um, I'll just leave with this that I hope other commissioners might share some of my thoughts, and especially the ones who are lawyers, Rob, Kathy, Bob, or have some criminal justice experience would, would take a look at that or offer suggestions. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming. Um, I, I'm a little confused, though, as to who uses your services, how they're used, what courts, I mean, are they, is it mandated, is it not? I mean, I'm kind of new into the law business of, of this. So, um, you know, it seems, it, it seems to me when I look at 48 to 60% of the population is, you know, currently is pre-sentenced yeah. people, then I, it, it's hard for me to imagine that you guys are, you know, using this with every arrestee, is that more no. the focus of what we want to do down the line? Yes, absolutely. And so right now, like what percentage of um, arrestees that do you guys even see? That's a very good question. Um, and that's one of the barriers that we talked about is because only certain individuals are brought directly to the sheriff's department after they're arrested. We only have access to those individuals before they're arraigned. And the whole goal of that is to get that information in front of the court so they have that information to make the decision that they're going to make about bail and whatever else, other conditions that are going to be. So currently, we, we focus on those courts that bring them directly there. <clears throat> with the staffing that we have, we're able to see about 10% of the bookings that come into the jail. 
It averages about 350, 360 bookings a week, and we see about 40 individuals a week. Really? So okay. there is a, a great need for expansion in terms of pretrial services, not only with staff, <clears throat> but again, with the, the jail reform study that came out, the physical space to put staff. Mm. <clears throat> you literally run out of room to put workstations if we had them to be able to go into the jail and see them. Because I, I mean, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it would seem that since you're seeing such a small percentage of a small percentage, basically, mm. right? Because I mean, south of Hall Road, really, for the most part, um, isn't going in and being booked at the sheriff department. Mm. Um, so. It, it seems like there's a huge part of this population that's taking up beds in the prison system that might be eligible and even recommended for a, a different treatment, uh, a tether, uh, you know, all of these different things that get them out. I don't, I don't understand. Do any of the other police departments, uh, are they able to use you if they want? Or yes, absolutely. Um, the system that we have, on, and we have a, a very positive working relationship with all the district courts um, in our area, and the way that that functions is a little bit differently because we don't have access to them, but what will happen is that when they're seen at arraignment, those judges will make immediate referrals to us for a bond recommendation. Mm -hmm. So it's not a pretrial report that gets to them that quickly, but they're asking for our information and our input into where they should be after the first time that that individual is in front of the judge. And we see a number of those. Um, we have very high numbers from 37th and 39th, um, as well as 40th district right. courts. But being that you only get to see a small percentage of even the people that come into the jail mm -hmm. and at the sh sheriff department, I mean, are you even able to handle all those requests? Uh, the the other district court requests? Yes, yeah, so with additional staffing that we have with our clinical side, um, our pretrial specialists are the ones that take care of those pre-arraignment mm. reports, and then we have clinical staff that are above and beyond that that take care of the requests for um, whether it be outpatient substance abuse or inpatient residential, things like that. So there are okay. additional staff. It seems like there should be some type of a study that's able to be done that would show increased staff on your side, which gets to see, you know, 80 to 90% at sure. least of the population coming in and what that being able to see all them, how much that would reduce our in-house costs. I mean, because if a lot of these people, uh, so you see, I don't know what you just said. I forget the percentage. About it, was a, 10%. it was a low percent, right? I'm just saying it was something <laughs> yeah, ridiculously it's very low. small. So out of that 10%, like how many do you find you can defer to you know, out of the jail, and I don't really know right now, I don't care, but I'm just saying, sure. so even in that small percentage, if mm -hmm. you're taking 40% of them in saying, all right, tether, um, you know, different programs that don't require jail space, that that would be exponentially larger and probably save us a ton of money down, down the line. It, it would seem like we could get, like that would be the study I would love to see on how to expand your program on really what it could save in jail space before we start looking at are we rebuilding a jail with as many beds or does your um, w would your program expanded cause us to need half the beds well and I think that's really and, and like I mentioned before that the whole idea of us being able to bring more staff in to be able to do those pretrial recommendations and screenings and being able to identify individuals who might be appropriate for specialty courts or residential treatment things like that the way that the jail design is right now we literally don't have people we, we don't have room for people mm -hmm. so if we expanded the amount of office um, staff that we had clinicians pretrial staff there's nowhere to put them and there's also you've gotten to a point where there's nowhere to complete assessments um, you know within the jail because of the areas that you know you're sort of left with once you have lawyer visits and you know things like that so that it becomes a logistical issue which I think is what they're trying to fix with some of those proposals okay just seems like there's a lot more to do before we start looking at a millage for a new jail I mean and I, I agree I think I'm on your track right there with trying to figure out what the long-term plan is and what that should bring us before we build another, you know, thousand bed jail and realize that in increasing your guys' capacity could mean could require us a 400 bed jail, right? I mean, or it causes us to require only that. I'd like to see a little more of that and, and not, you know, I don't need any more answers on it, but I think I see where we should be looking right now. So thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Leonard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see you, Barb. You. Um, you know, my understanding from the jail study was pretty clear. If you look at it, the gentleman said, look, if we don't do money and, and stuff into pretrial services, if we don't focus on pretrial services, we're going to have to double the number of beds that we have in the jail. So if we don't do something with pretrial services, we're going to go from 1,800 beds to something like 2,800 beds that we're going to need. 
And I remember asking Sheriff Wickersham, I said, look, I'm not a guy that likes brick and mortar. I shop on Amazon, right? I mean, that's a terrible thing to say for retail. But the bottom line is data is what's really important here. And that's what pretrial services is excellent at doing. And I can tell you as a private attorney, you know, I, information that they provide is very helpful to the judges, to the attorneys, in terms of helping us decide right at the get-go what's an appropriate thing to do for a client or a defendant that's in front of the court. <clears throat> now, I want to ask you some questions, if I could, Okay. With, now that I pontificate it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there's no question that there's a lack, that link, there should be a link between all the district courts and the circuit court. I'm amazed at this day and age that we don't have that. When I'm in court at 39th District Court and I have somebody that I'm appointed on or something like that, it's amazing that nobody at the 39th District Court can tell if this person has a case at 36, because they often do. Mm -hmm. They often have another case at 37th and they have a matter at St. you know, in the 40th District Court. Sure. So ironically, we had the uh, IT guy here yesterday. Have okay. you met with him? Have you talked to him? We have been had ongoing conversations with IT, with our assigned staff, and in the improvements that we can make and some of the projects that are going on that they have with Circuit Court. We're kind of it's sort of a waiting pattern to see what they come with there before we can either link into that or come up with our own version of how to access that information. Because I think from what Chair Smith said and what Chair mm -hmm. or not Chair, not Chair Majek, but Commissioner Majek said, mm -hmm. for us to make a decision, I, I agree with the study, more data means less brick and mortar. It's mm -hmm. not to say that we're not going to have to do brick and mortar, but data is cheaper than brick and mortar. You agree? Well, if that's what the data points to. And yeah. I, you know, for it's, my... It's, understanding of this study there's not a drastic increase in the number of beds that's it's right. changing the way that we do what we're doing as long as the, the, the number of beds will not be that drastic as long as we provide a good pretrial service yeah. so here's and I asked Sheriff Wickersham he said he was gonna come back and show some diagrams and some plans and I asked him and I want to make this clear I don't want to just see brick-and-mortar plans I want to see what we're talking about with linking the district courts and the circuit courts so that data can be shared. I want to see some ideas of what pretrial services is going to do mm -hmm. so that we can implement that most important part of that study, which ultimately is designed to make it so that we don't have to build a whole new jail or, mm -hmm. or more beds. And so I'd like to I'd, I'd like to have your commitment that you'll you and Sheriff Wickersham and the IT guy would be able to at some point give us a plan so that when we I don't think I don't know if it's going to be for this year's budget, sure. but at some point for the commission to take a look at that. I think that's very important. It, it is, and I um, definitely worked closely with the consultants that came in to look at the pretrial programming um, and the diversion programming to treatment that they pro were proposing and was involved in what they were looking at for essential intake facilities so that our staff would have the ability, the, the space, and the access um, you know, to prisoners to be able to you know, get that. But I do agree, the lack of information that we have about what you know who's being arrested in Macomb County you know that took a very long time for them to access because there is no central location for that so I, I agree with we that. need that one last thing and I don't like to really compare ourselves to them okay yeah. but Oakland County <laughs> Oakland County has a very extensive pretrial service yes and correct me if I'm wrong but they have pretrial service personnel in the courts in every district court yeah. okay has that been thought of for Macomb in yeah. other words, if you're talking about space at the jail that you need for your mm. database, why can't we just use all the courts that we've already got structures for and put pretrial personnel there and have a link to a central database? You need a couple offices at the jail mm -hmm. where this information can be exchanged. Is that a feasible possibility? You know, it's an option. Um, it's, I think, a more expensive and sort of cumbersome operation than we would like to see um, because not only are we talking about um, screening for pretrial services and that, that report that would be given to the court, but you're also looking at scre screening for mental health issues that need to be addressed immediately, you know, in addition and above and beyond that. So. Well, I get that, but really most actions start at the district court. Yes. And so when somebody's picked up by the police in Roseville, mm -hmm. they're hauled in front of the district court judge hopefully within 24 hours. Yes. Yeah. If you have pretrial personnel assigned to that court, mm. instead of being out in the Macomb County Jail, it just seems like the information could be quicker. That's what we're looking for. Mm. And if we have a link with the internet, we've got central database that we can use mm -hmm. to, to exchange that information. It's, it's an option that I'd like to see. It's certainly a possibility. I mean, they're do, you know, as you're well aware, they're doing it in Oakland County. That's so. right. And I, I hate to compare ourselves to, no. I don't, as Oakland County gets snooty when I go out there, <laughs> but they do have, they do have a pretty efficient system mm -hmm. and uh, they have a bigger population than we do yeah. and their jail, they've seemed to maintain some bit of control on that. So 
I, I would definitely like to see your plans. I, I think, and let me just say this, before I vote on anything, I want to see your plans first because I think your plans are integral from what I saw in that report to making sure that we get the right bang for our buck when it comes to whatever we're going to do here with the jail. All right, thank, thank you. you. Commissioner Romano. Thank you, Madam, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question and then some statements if I may. Thank you for coming. Sure. Uh, these residential services that you, uh, that you offer, uh, are those costs ever reimbursed to us by either the, uh, the uh, I don't want to call them a criminal, but the drug abuser, or, and they are criminals, the drug abuser or the families, they ever reimburse us back any of those costs? No, but the majority of them are not funded by the county. Um, the majority of our funding comes from the Michigan Department of Corrections. And they pay for those residential services out of their budget. Uh, we do receive some funding, and then we're able to link with, like I mentioned before, Macosis funding. If someone has, say, for example, Healthy Michigan or Medicaid, that they're able to tap into those. So our res the, the amount of money that we actually pay for residential services is fairly small. So, I'm sorry. So the same question. The individual themselves, do they pay? It's if they have coverage or if they're able to in certain circumstances, they pay directly to the provider. Otherwise, no, it's not reimbursed to us. And we can't go back to the families looking mm -hmm. for payment. I suppose you could. That would take um, uh, some additional accounting and staff in my office to be able to track that down in terms of something similar to a jail reimbursement. Uh, you know, it, it just seems to me that um, we have the residential services, we have the outpatient program, um, I see a lot of things that we're doing for the abusers. I don't see too much that we're doing for the residents. Um, I hear people saying they don't want any more brick and mortar. I certainly want more brick and mortar. I don't want these people on the street. Now, I'm not talking about the marijuana user and the guy that pops the pills. I'm talking about the hard people that go out, will rob, steal, cheat, whatever's necessary, and they're doing it to our residents so that they can get these drugs. So the problem is let's get to the root of the problem. And again, this is just a statement, which is, the people that are providing these drugs. So the sheriff locks them up. I don't want these people back on the street. Now, your programs sound wonderful, mm -hmm. but as you and I both know, and the commissioners know, the rate of recidivism is outstanding. Mm -hmm. These people go to jail, and they talk to the other jail inmates, and they get more places to pick up their drugs or their junk or whatever they're going to do. So even though your programs are warm and fuzzy, I don't think they're solving the problem, and I think Sheriff Wickersham has the right idea. Put them where they'd be, and I'm talking, now, please appreciate. I'm talking about the hard drug users that are back and forth, back and forth. They're in your program two or three times, am I correct? Once they, they can come into your program two or three times. Yes, they can. Yeah. So we're, and we're paying for all that. So I, you know, it's nice to have these programs, but I think they're a waste of money. The hardcore ones, stick them in the brick and mortar, let them pay the price. They're criminals. They should be charged as criminals and treated as criminals. That's my personal opinion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Barb, thank you very much for uh, coming here and uh, uh, discussing the overview. Um, the question on recidivism, and it goes along with uh, part of what everybody's talked about. Have you tracked the uh, people that are in the JJC, whether uh, graduates, if you will, from the JJC end up at the uh, adult jail? as a percentage? No, I, I do not have any access to the information on those individuals who have been in the JJC. Um, and most of that information isn't, wouldn't be readily available to most because it's juvenile charges, so they're likely, right. um, you know, that's, th those are things that are sort well, of protected. Well, I'm, ju I'm just wondering if, if they're not, uh, going along with Commissioner Romano's statement, if they're not uh, defining their craft at the JJC, uh, and graduating into bigger and better things. Um, I think it'd be interesting to see if there is a correlation. Uh, one, two, um, uh, although there is a lot of talk about brick and mortar and so on and so forth, I, you know, common sense tells me that the more population we have, the more uh, people we're going to have with that end up in jail one way or another. Um, that being said, do we have a lot of people going into jail and so on and so forth or that you see that are getting brought in on pot charges versus the heroin abusers or users? 
No, I would I would say without actual data in front of me, but just our sort of anecdotal information from working in the jail every day and with the population, um, compared to a felony possession of a controlled substance, which is a, a opiate or okay. heroin, cocaine, things of that nature, um, those are a much greater percentage than what your possession of marijuanas are, which is a misdemeanor offense in most cases, depending on the quantity. All right. Um, uh, we get... A report from the uh, medical examiner as far as um, uh, people ODing on on heroin and so on and so forth, and that's that really is something that's an epidemic going on in Macomb County uh, throughout Michigan, actually. Mm -hmm. But it's something nobody ever talks about. Um, do you see people coming back uh, on the op on the opioid or heroin? bandwagon if you want to pull it put it uh that uh, the recidivism rate is rather high or do you see people that are graduating out of that and, and getting out of that other than dying we see both um what we've seen that has been kind of and again it's it's sort of a newer issue so having hard data on that can i, I can actually speak to um is difficult but we see both and what you are seeing is that this this opiate use is sort of um it, it's a younger population um and what we are seeing is groups of individuals who are kind of starting their own recovery systems um you will now <clears throat> in any area of the county um you know go to a 12-step program or a narcotics anonymous program if you're familiar with that term um and see groups of young people who are in recovery and who are maintaining sobriety and so on one hand where you still do have a very high recidivism rate whether it's in the criminal justice population um, or just in the general community, uh, you do see sort of a new idea of recovery with these individuals who have been using either prescription drugs or prescription opiates um, and um, heroin. Really? So it is, it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon that as you see the same population, you see sort of recovery changing to meet that population. All right, very good, interesting. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your presentation. Um, like Commissioner Majek, I don't have a criminal justice background, so I'm learning a lot, so bear with me. You may have answered this question already uh, when Commissioner Leonetti was rattling off questions to you, but it deals with the uh, barriers about the, the link systems. Is that an issue from us as a county? Is that a state, like does that need to be a state law? Is that because we at the county don't have the technology to do that? Are there barriers because there are state laws on the books that says you can't transfer that data from this court to that court? What, what's the reason for that? Um, it's because the majority of um, those district courts run on their own systems using, um, I don't even think there's a really, um, uh, like a single system that's used most of the time by the district courts. It really, really varies um, into uh, the degree of what information it, it holds and, and what you can glean from it. But I know that it's really a separation of county services um, and even the district courts that are within the county and the the um, district courts that are outside of us, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, you know other layers of juvenile court and you know things like that. So it's just the systems are so separate. <clears throat> very similar to what um, you know the sheriff had talked about with the presentation that um, with the local police departments th the same sort of idea very separate that information those people all of those things don't flow very easily because they're so disconnected okay and I know Commissioner Leonetti said that uh, <clears throat> Oakland County is, is a little more efficient do they have a linked system or is are they like us but they're just better at performing I'm just trying we, to figure this out that's okay <laughs> um, the whole the whole idea of Oakland County is that no they don't have a link system to my knowledge um, not at this point anyway but they have community correction staff in each and every one of the district courts so they don't really have to have um, a system because they're there physically getting it okay they can access that information very so we easily. could go about it that way and that could be a solution aside you know apart from linking the systems we could physically put people there to do that you could now my understanding is again that's a much it's a more expensive way to do sure. it but it's it can be done okay thank you thank you madam chair thank you thank you madam chair Hi, Barb. hello you're rocking it so far <laughs> I think you've impressed everybody <laughs> some good questions um, <clears throat> question I have for you is how close do you work with a community mental health 
Uh, very on some of our cases. Um, it depends on the situation. Community mental health, you know, really deals with those who are severely and mentally ill. And those individuals don't always translate good to um, to community corrections eligibility because we don't have placements that can manage the level of need that they have. So sometimes we do, and, and on those occasions, it's usually very intensively. Um, but for the most part, most of those cases that we handle would be eligible for us and likely not appropriate for them or ver vice versa. Okay. And the reason why I asked that, uh there's millions of dollars that's coming in, and I believe it's from the alcohol tax um, that comes in and can only be used for um, uh, counseling. Through MACOSA, is that what you're referencing? Well, uh, it's not MACOSA. I believe it's uh, community mental health, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. And those funds are for, um, could be utilized, and there was extra funds brought in in the last few years, more than what was anticipated, and I wanted to have it redirected over to you. Um, and I don't have that in front of me, so I apologize. But those funds should be able to be used for what you are doing. I believe I know what you're talking about. I, I'm, I think it's it's dollars that come through community mental health through Macosa, and I think that we had met a couple of years ago, maybe, um, to discuss the possibility of doing that. And there are some issues with the way that those dollars are allocated are for substance abuse services specifically. So it wouldn't be able to, an, anything we could do with our pretrial programming. It would have to be specifically for substance abuse is what my understanding is. And, and I agree with you. Mm -hmm. So funds can be relieved from there that you can use for the other portion of what you're doing mm -hmm. and backfill it with those funds. Sure. Then you're able to get, what, you know, have more funds to do what you need. I see what you're saying, yeah. And I have an uh, issue that you're not receiving those funds for that um, with all the counseling and, and what you have happening. Um, again, this is something I'm willing to dig into again. I know it's probably been three years. I didn't know it was that long, but I, I'm going to get back into it because I think we're missing the boat here. And I think the, and if I'm not mistaken, I'm talking, you know, close to $9 million. So I will get back on my end and do that, and I'll get back in touch with you on that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, for recognizing me for a second time. I, uh, this is not a comment specifically to you or uh, anything like that, but it, so it comes as a bit random, but I, re I recall reading an article, I just looked it up online, from MLive uh, almost exactly a year ago that the state had closed another prison and that the state's prison population has declined 20% in the last 11 years and that the state has closed, let me see, uh, Closed or consolidated more than 25 facilities and camps since 2005, saving $370 million, the Department of Corrections said. So the state has been going through a prison closing and consolidation as crime has declined 20% in the state of Michigan. Makes me wonder if there is used space available already built, you know, St. Clair County Correctional Facility or some, some partnership that we could do with, um, with the state to take up some of this available corrections facilities and again I'm, I'm throwing out there randomly so I don't expect any uh, it has nothing to do with your presentation but it just occurs to me it's strange that we're looking at where we can get dollars to build new pr prison facilities while the state is trying to figure out what to do with their old ones I actually if you don't mind can comment on that um, the majority of those facilities are um, in the northern part of Michigan if not in the upper peninsula um, and they've been able to do that because they're utilizing programs like ours right. um, where they're doing alternatives to incarceration um, and really looking at um, the parolee and probation population and providing treatment services and things of that nature. But the, like I said, the majority of those, those facilities are in, in sort of far away. Sure, it'd be nice to ship the St. Clair County uh, prisoners up to those upper peninsula ones and open up some space nearby us. They could just sh do a little shifting around. You know, again, it's just a it's just a thought. It just seemed odd that they're they're trying to figure out how to close prisons, and we're trying to figure out how to get capacity. That maybe there could be some synergy there. But thank you. <coughs> thank you. Um, you know, many times we talk about overcrowding, and then people bring up the prison on Twenty Six Mile Road. Mm -hmm. That's filled. They're filled. I know people work up there. Yes, I'm so familiar with the that facility. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other one is, is about clothes. When the prisoner is brought from the jail over, mm -hmm. they're in the uniform. The judge doesn't look that you're in uniform. With, he's, he's looking at the crime and what he's going to be charged with. Mm -hmm. The guy that has a suit on, somebody 
brought clothes, he can change right there in the jail. So it isn't a case of him looking, well, you look at in a, in a, in a jumpsuit, you're, you're gonna get nailed. The judge doesn't look at that. Okay, the third part is the tether. Is I know how it works and everything mm -hmm. else, but who, the, the tether company gets them out of, who pays for that if they are not, if they don't come up with the money? How do they do that? We, when we receive a referral from a court um, to allow an individual to be released from the jail with a um, electronic monitoring device, um, we meet with that individual and determine if they're able to pay. So we look at their income um, and other in, you know, information that we use to determine that. If they are unable, we can provide the hookup fee, which is um, expensive. And uh, the first couple of weeks up to the first month, we've done several months before, depending on the circumstance, if that individual was more appropriately supervised in the community. So we can provide those dollars um, with funds that we have to be able to keep them in the community. Is, is that a budgeted amount for the county or from the state? Both. There's both. actually dollars so that any come way from you both. Bite it, if they get out, we, we the taxpayers are paying for them to get out. For those individuals, yes. Yeah. Okay. That those are within our budget, like I said, both from the county general fund dollars and those state funds. And and the other thing is, how many? I, I know you don't know how many at this time, but there's a lot of prisoners. There are a lot of prisoners in that jail mm -hmm. that just don't get out because nobody bonds them out. Certainly. Whether the bond's a low one or a big one. Yep. Is that true? With the Absolutely. And uh, that could empty the jail pretty quick. I don't know if it would empty, but it would I certainly mean, reduce the population. You won't ever have this overcrowding stuff? We and and what we see regularly is individuals who, um, you know, for example, have pretty major medical issues, and so the sheriff's department is responsible for transporting that person if they have an emergency to the hospital. They're responsible for a deputy um, working overtime to sit with that person 24 hours a day, and um, which costs about $1,400 a day, I think. Um, when I, they originally had a $500 bond or something to that effect. So that what we're trying to do is identify those individuals with those very low bonds, particularly in those, case, those cases, and make recommendations to those courts to let them know, you know the, the person's risk um, in those situations where they're really sort of putting some hardship on the sheriff's department, what the situation is, and, um, and seeing if there's any alternative we can provide to them. My last question is that I, I, you're talking to somebody who d did that for you many years. So my, my point is, I've known the fact it's been going on for a long time. Why does not, why don't you get together with a hospital, which mm -hmm. is the local hospital, and get a room wherever it may be in a hospital? Because there's been many a times that there's three and four prisoners that are taken to a hospital and that a deputy has to be brought in right around the clock. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you got one room, you could have one or two deputies instead of floating around. I know it's a financial thing, but it's a cheaper way of doing it. Um, I'm sure it's something that could be explored. Um, I think that some of the issues are that when you have individuals who go in, it's really up to hospital administration and their floor plan where they're housed or if they can be housed together. You also have classification issues in terms of prisoners that can't be in the same room together, things of that nature. So. Mm -hmm. It, it's, uh, it's been going on for years yeah. and it has not stopped yet. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, touch on what Commissioner Gillette said with respect to the state. And you indicated their, their jails are emptying because of those types of services. But um, I'm also hearing, serving on the Michigan Association of Counties Board, one of the issues MAC has is criminal justice reform at the state that clears out their prisons, early paroles and things like that, but doesn't address the problems. So they come back to our community and the savings that they're achieving mm. are not being funneled back to us to now deal with them. So um, um, from our standpoint, we support the, the idea of uh, not having all these nonviolent offenders in prison, mm. but if they're coming back to the communities, the communities are the ones that, specifically counties, but also um, at the local level for police officers, are the ones that are going to have to deal with them and that money's not flowing back here. So um, 
uh, this whole discussion about not having money for this, the state is saving a lot of money as they're clearing out our prisons, but that's growing our population. So thank you. Questions or speakers? There's a motion on the floor. All those in favor, please. Motion's repeat and file. Barb, thank you very much for coming. I appreciated your presentation. I know that you put a lot of work into that. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. And you knew all the answers. <laughs> <laughs>